All right, getting comfy, getting ready. Another day, another stream, another project for us to work on, uh, and more things to learn. Just got some water. I'm gonna take a little sip. The audio should be sounding a little bit more uh, crisp, a little bit better. I did some tweaking uh, of my audio, audio settings this morning. So hopefully, hopefully it'll sound better. Uh, I'm waiting on a new microphone arm and a pop filter. So once that arrives, I will do some further tweaking to the audio. So hopefully then it'll sound a little bit more better. One step at a time. We'll get there. Uh, it's not it's not exactly where I want it to be just yet. Um, but we're getting there. So. Let's jump into what we had yesterday, which is the the only project left for us on the JavaScript part two. Uh, yeah, and then we'll do a review and we'll jump into building interactive websites with JavaScript. Uh, so today the stream will be a little bit fragmented because uh, later in the day um, I have a an interview that I have to go to. So I'll be gone for roughly an hour and a half, up to two hours, uh, and we'll pick it up uh, back up on around maybe one o'clock. Um, wait, no, probably not one o'clock. Uh, now that I'm, now that I'm thinking, actually, uh, let me check quickly. Uh, no, not one o'clock. The, the interview will be at one o'clock. Uh, so I'll probably be gone from roughly 12 to two. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit of a shorter stream today, I guess, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, these kind of disruptions probably won't happen too often. So, okay, let's, uh, Let's jump into it, I guess. All right, so yesterday we did the project of car checker. It was it was pretty fun. Um, we did a few, we did have a few hiccups there, but eventually we managed to solve it. And today we have the mysterious organism project. Um, so let's just jump into the goal. Uh, the context is that you're part of a research team that's found a new mysterious organism at the bottom of the ocean near a hydrothermal near hydrothermal vents. Uh, my team names the organism Pila acor and finds that it, it is it, that it is only comprised of 15 DNA bases. The DNA samples and the frequency at, at which it mutates due to the hydrothermal vents makes P acor an interesting specimen to study. However, uh, PA core cannot survive above sea level, and locating it in the deep sea is difficult and expensive. So our job is to create objects that simulate the, the DNA for the research team to study. All right, seems interesting. We already have some code pre-written for us. We'll take a look at that in a second. Right, so in order to complete this project, we should complete a first few sections of introduction to JavaScript. We already done that. Um, so the project requirements, look over the starter code. There are two helper functions, return random base and mockup strand. DNA is comprised of four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Uh, when returning ran base, when return ran base is called, it will randomly select a base and return the base a, T, C, or G. Uh -huh, so it'll return one base. Right? Uh, and mockup strand is used to generate an array containing 15 bases to represent a single DNA strand. 
with 15 bases. Okay, pretty standard stuff. So this, uh, let's add to the comments just so it is fully clear what they do. Uh, let me just move my shirt into a working position. Eh, there we go. Uh, all right, so returns a random base and let's just say like A, G, C, or T, and then returns a random single strand of DNA containing 15 bases. Uh, like, so this returns a new, uh, a new array. Okay. So, like, let's say A, G, T, C, A, A, and so on. Um, all right. So, since you need to create multiple objects, create a factory function that has two parameters. The first parameter is a number, and no two organisms should have the same number. So we'll need uh, some kind of random function, I'm guessing. And the second parameter is an array of 15 DNA bases. The factory function should return an object that contains the properties of species number and DNA that correspond to the parameters provided. You'll also add more methods to this returned object in the later steps. Um, okay, so the species number, specimen number uh, is, we don't have to generate that. It'll be provided when the object is created. And the DNA strand, we can just get from the mockup strand function. Uh, interesting thing though. This returns a sing. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Never mind. I I thought like we have to build a strand, but like no, we don't. Um. All right, so let's create the factory. Um, we probably just so I have a reference. Let's open up our little cheat sheet again because these things hardly stick in my head. Uh, where is it now? Every time I have trouble finding where the cheat sheet is. Career path group, view path. All right, let's do it like we did yesterday. Sheet, sheet. Uh, do, 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 do. We have loops, objects. Okay, one of these should be what we need there objects <laughs> and let's take a look at our factory function all right so it's pretty standard uh like yesterday we have to not forget the return statement in the beginning but other other than that it looks like a little bit of a mesh of a function syntax and object syntax all right, so let's let's do it. Uh, we need a p a core weird spelling uh, factory, and we will be taking in right. We'll be taking in two oh, two parameters. We'll be taking in the specimen number. and we will be taking in the DNA. However, uh, would it be possible to assign a function call as a def de default parameter? Because that would be really useful. All we would have to do is just provide the specimen number and the random DNA strand would be provided for us upon the creation of the object. Mm. Let's try it. Uh, JavaScript default function parameters. 
so just the equal sign. Okay, uh, so let's say DNA equals and mock up strand. So just the function call to the mock up strand. Maybe that works. We'll take it. We'll see. So, uh, further on, essentially, we, all we have to do is just add a return statement and then model our object. So, the sp uh, blah, blah, blah. specimen number will be specimen number and our DNA will be DNA, right? I think so. That's all there is to it. Okay, so now if we say want to create um, one P acor specimen, then all we have to do is just call the, oh my God, a core spelling is right. A E Q O U O R. Yeah. Uh, we call the factory and we provide the specimen number. Let's say specimen number one. And so when we save this, yes, we get the specimen number and we get the DNA strand. So Call, a function call as a default parameter definitely works. All right, so ba, 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 that's all we really had to do. Let's move on. So our team wants uh, us to simulate PA core high rate of mutation uh, change in its DNA. To simulate a mutation in the PA core's factory returned object, add the method mutate. Mutate is responsible for randomly selecting a base in the object's DNA property and changing the current base to a different base. Then Mutate will return the object's DNA. For example, if the randomly selected base is the first base, and it is A, the base must be changed to T, C, or G, but it cannot be A again. Okay, uh... So... Let's add a mutate function. Hmm. I'm thinking whether there's a way to... Huh. No, but we have to randomly select the base. Yeah. Okay, so essentially, um, oh, one second, let's leave the function call here, just so we can see what's happening. Or matter of fact, let's not do a console log, let's just assign it to a variable. Um, let's call it first uh, first specimen. So then we can have read him calling in the methods later on. So mutate, uh, right. So for the first thing we need, it really is the random number by which the base will be selected. So, uh, let's do random base equals we can actually copy this and then since we have 15 numbers to choose from um how do we do that? Because we are getting 
uh, with random, we're getting a number from zero to one. And we need a way to multiply that so it doesn't return more than 15. Um, <laughs> let's see if there's like a calculator or something for that. JavaScript uh, random number. Or is there a way to specify the range? <laughs> so getting a random number between zero and one. Getting a random number between two values. This example returns a random number between the specified values. The return value is no lower than and may possibly equal min and is less than and not equal to max. Oh, okay, well, let's write ourselves this little helper function here. Uh, so that we don't have to do any complex math. Uh, let's see returns a random number between so we want to do um, zero and 14 right because zero one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen yeah so const uh, get random number get random let's call it base index yeah that's descriptive enough and we'll have to pass in the minimum value and the maximum value and so we return math random times uh, max minus min plus min. Right? Oh, we need a uh, no. We needed to do this with the ceiling. I mean, yeah, with the ceiling. We should be writing this function instead because this will return. Uh, we can actually demonstrate it. Console log. Uh, if we call get random base index, this will return numbers with a decimal value. So if we actually did 0, 0.14, no. Missing initializer in const declaration. What? Oh. Wait, what? Oh. There we go. Yeah, it returned nine. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I suppose we could just sealing that afterwards, but let's do it the proper way. Um, so, right. We need to get to modify this. We're still taking in min max, but we're doing const min sealed math.seal min const max lord equals math dot floor max 
Yes. And then we return math. Whoop. Math dot floor. Loot. Floor. Math dot random. Times. Max Lord minus min sealed plus min sealed. So it's essentially the same thing, except we sealed and floor the min and max values beforehand. So now if we run it, we get 7, 5, 5, 2, 2, 7, 4, 3, 11, 11, 13. Just checking if we get 0 and 14. 0. We got the 0. What about 14? No, we're passing in 14. We should be passing in 15 to get 14. got 13 oh there we go 14 all right so it works okay so let's delete that and let's assign this to our newly crafted function get random base index with 0 and 15. Okay, so once we get the random base, then we have to check which one it is. And based on that, we can then select a second one to replace it. Right? Uh, main P A uh, P A A A E Q O U. <laughs> oh my God! It's so so hard to spell. Main P A core uh, object building function. Um. Right. So I guess for that, we can also write a helper function too, so as to not pollute the main factory. Um, so uh, this function, this helper function would have to Ah, but how do we get the access to DNA? Because that's essentially what we need. Well, we have it at... Oh, never mind. We have the access in the main function. Mm, okay, so we get the access. We pass it into some sort of switch. Which will check based on... <laughs> based on the random base that we selected. And then, and then depending on which base it is, we can simply assign it one of the other ones. I think that should work. Let's let's see if we can implement that. Um, so function that checks for the random checks which base was selected and changes it. Okay, uh, 
So, let's call this... Hmm. <clears throat> mutate base. Or mutate DNA. Uh, DNA strand. Sure. Uh, we'll need... Just the DNA itself. No, we'll need the DNA and we'll need the random base. Uh, so, essentially what we're doing is we need a switch statement. So, uh, switch. switch that will be checking the DNA at random base index. Right? And then case where it will be. We have four cases. We'll have case A. We'll have case T. We'll have case G, and we will have a case A, T, and C. Right. So in each case, all we have to do is just switch the DNA the DNA base at random base index into one of the other three. But once again, how do we? Uh, how do we do that? We could do it manually, but I feel like that's a little bit of uh, that's a bit cheating, cheaty. I would like it to sort of uh, have a pool of bases to select from. So we could have, like, say, remaining, or no, let's call it shorter. Um, after a. Sure. And then we'll have all the remaining bases in there. So T, oh, T, yeah, G, and C. And then we can select from that pool every time after T. Uh, do, 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 do. This should be after G and then after C. And so this is fine. This gets replaced by A. Uh, this gets replaced by A. And this gets replaced by A. Right, so the only thing left to do is simply somehow pull a random one from this array. And one of the first ways that I'm thinking about doing it is just selecting Again, a random number from zero to, th to two, and then just picking it that way. Right, so, okay, because uh, we already have a get random base index function. 
between actually specified numbers. So all we have to do is do rand rand left over equals uh, and we call our random <coughs> base index with zero and three. Right? I think so. And then all we have to do is simply DNA at random base becomes the uh, rand left over. I think this should work. So all we have to do is just copy paste that in all the four things rent left over now let's just call these the same as the variables above uh rent left over a oh just copy paste it here there we go and then finally we just return the DNA strand or the array containing the DNA strand. I think this should work. Okay. Missing initializer in const declaration. 24. Ah, right. All right, so it works. Um, so let's take a look, uh, console log first specimen and first specimen, right? So we get this DNA. Now, if we call mutate on first specimen, first specimen dot mutate. And we console log the first specimen again. Wait a sec. No, 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 no. Uh, we should be passing the object. <clears throat> because right now, this didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, right. Oh, no, never mind. We because we're doing it inside the factory. So all we really have to do is um yeah, we didn't he we didn't put the uh, the function call in here. So mutate uh DNA strand we just call the function here. And we call it with the specimen's DNA and the random base. T 
T T T A G A C C T zero. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> okay. Oh, never mind. Uh, we were supposed to do after A, and then have that in here. Yeah. Let's copy that. Let's replace the T's. Uh, this should be G's. And this should be C's. So, CTA turned into a T and everything else is the same. Yeah, it works. Awesome. Okay, this is cool. I like this. I love this. Um, <clears throat> so let's just make sure we did everything that was required because I am known to skip steps and not read things properly. Uh, so, add a method, mutate, done. Mutate is responsible for randomly selecting a base in the object's DNA property and changing the current base to a different base. Then mutate will return the object's DNA. Yes, that's exactly what it's doing. And uh, so for example, if randomly selected base is the first base and it is A, the base must be changed to T, C or G, but it cannot be A again. So yeah, it should should be working fine. It's is it the most elegant solution? This function? No. There's probably a way to make it more streamlined, probably do it with less uh, less lines of code, but, you know, it works. All right, let's move on. Uh, so our research team wants to be able to compare the DNA sequences of different PA core. You'll have to add a new method, compare DNA, to the returned object of the factory function. Uh, compare DNA has one parameter, and that is the another PA core object. The behavior of compare DNA is to compare the current PA cores DNA with the past in PA cores DNA and compute how many bases are identical and in the same location. Okay. Uh, so compared DNA does not return anything, but prints a message that states the percentage of DNA the two objects have in common. Oh, that sounds like math. Um, <laughs> so use the specimen number to identify which PA core objects are being compared. So this one should have a 25% share only have the third element in common, which is T, and therefore have 25% or one fourth of their DNA in common. The resulting message would read something along the lines of specimen one and specimen two have 25% DNA in common. Uh, okay, let's break it down. Let's b -b 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 break it down. What do we have to do? Well, we need a function. That's that's pretty clear. Uh, we need a helper function that will take in two objects. Let's actually write this down. Uh, a function that takes in two objects right and then then does what well we obviously have to probably iterate through both arrays right so we have to 
we have to iterate through both arrays. And we could have um, we could have a sort uh, counter, right? Because when we're iterating, it doesn't really matter to us. We're only looking for matches at specific places. So, huh? I'm thinking now whether we could pull this off with either like array parameters or I mean uh, array methods. Um, one second. Right, so <laughs> no, probably every doesn't work for us. I'm thinking maybe map, method ins creates a new array populated with the results of calling a provided function on every element in the calling array. And uh, no. Mm. Reduce right, reverse shift slice, some sort splice. What is with? Is the copying version of using bracket notation to change the value of a given index? Okay, no, that's not what we need. Um, <laughs> every? No, but how would we work in well we could have either two for loops or we could have a single for loop which but we don't need to test it against everything uh we have to are identical and in the same locations So what we really need to do, we probably need two for loops. But we're wasting a lot of time because, okay, let's say these are the two, two arrays that we're checking against, right? So when we check the first element against the first element, if it's not a match, Oh, we can just add a break statement and we can move on. And if it's a match, we can simply increase a counter. So that when we iterate through both, through the entire array, we get a number. And that number divided by 15 will essentially be the percentage that we're looking for. I think so. And we need a counter to keep track of how many faces were identical. So, yeah. All right, let's do it. Uh, so, 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 compare. Let's 
let's call it differently because that's what our method is supposed to be called. So let's do compare DNA strands. Sure. Don't forget the equal sign again. And we will need to take in two objects. So object one and object two. <clears throat> so then we have to iterate through both of these arrays. And I'm pretty sure we can just do a simple for a loop. So for base in, so for, blah, 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 for base of object one dot DNA, right? Because that's how we will be accessing it. There. And then for let base two of object object two dot DNA. And so we also need a variable. So uh, let's see counter. Uh, sure. Or let's do equal zero. So if Uh, so what are we looking for here? What What's the if statement here? If the base equals base two, then we increase the counter and we continue. Right? Otherwise, we just continue. Yeah. So return base equals base two. And if it does, we increase the counter. Counter plus plus. Otherwise. Oh, never mind. Let's do a normal one. If base space two then the counter plus plus and continue will this work Let's take a look. And so in the end, we'll have a counter. And all we have to do is just, we don't even need a return statement. All we have to do is just console log uh, specimen object one dot specimen num and do, 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 do. and object two dot specimen 
num have uh they have counter divided by 15 times 100 percent percent DNA in common. Think so? Let's try it. We have the first specimen, and now we can have a second specimen. Second specimen with the DNA. Voila. Two. Right. So now if we call compare blah, com, compare DNA strands and pass in the first specimen and the second specimen, we should be getting a string. 400. Okay, never mind. We don't need to multiply that by 100. Uh, do we? Time times 100. But I think we have to put these in parentheses. No, what? I'm just bad at math, aren't I? <laughs> um ba -ba 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 -ba. how to get percentage of two numbers consider two numbers sorry let us calculate blah 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 we divide the part 30 by the whole number 45 and the result is and multiply the result by 100 yeah oh my god I have to take a leak so I'll be back in a second Okay, I'm back. Ah, gotta get comfy again. All right, so what did we do wrong? We divide part 30 by the whole number 45 and multiply the result by 100. Well, that's what we did. Let's see. Uh, where's our function? There. Let's console log the counter at the end here. Console log counter. Counter is 58. Excuse me. Huh. 
How is it 58? Uh What? All right. Log. Base. And Base two. Base. Base two. Whoa. Um, fifty six. That is weird. Maybe not continue then, break. Yeah, break. Because we want to break out of this loop. But they have identical DNAs. How is that possible? T T A T A T A. What? That shouldn't be a thing. Because with every new specimen, we should be getting a random strand. How are they the same? It's always a hundred. Oh, now it's not. Uh, so we have, no, it's 11. What? Never mind. Right, we're only supposed to do this if they don't match. Oh, no, that's not how you do it. You delete this and then that. Uh, now it's giving us the wrong thing. Uh, counter, counter. Okay, so how is it 100% DNA match? When 
clearly all of it is different. Because... 15 divided by 15 is 1, and 1 divided by 100 is 100. Yeah, that makes sense. It's counting it correctly. Uh, our calculations are wacky. Um, I guess all we have to do is just return sort of the opposite. Wait, what if we get not 15? They're always different. Hmm. How many bases? are identical and in the same positions. Compare DNA does not return anything. Prints a message that says percentage of DNA the two objects have in common. Maybe we should do 15 divided by counter. It's the same thing. It's gonna be the same thing. Yeah. Uh, huh. So we had 14 divided by 15, and then we times it 100 minus 100, you get six. So I guess we could do, just add this to the parentheses and then do minus 100. and then have this whole thing as an absolute value. Oh, it's not happy. ABS is not defined. Math ABS? Yep. Okay. So I think it works. Like most of the time, the two specimens, they do not share any DNA. Because, yeah. Because the DNA strands get generated randomly. Um, I mean, it makes sense to me. But 
Is that the actual correct way to do it? Or rather, is that what the exercise is asking of us? Okay, so let's let's finish writing. Uh, so we also need to incorporate this into the main object. So compare. Wait, do we? Uh, do, 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 do. New method to the returned object of the factory function. Right. Okay, compare DNA. Uh, it's supposed to take two parameters. The first one being the DNA strand of its L of itself. No. Uh, one parameter. The other object. Let's say object two because we are object one. And so we simply return or no we just call uh, compare DNA strands strengths strands on this and object two right right I think <clears throat> let's try it. So first specimen dot compare DNA on the second specimen. Yes, it works the same exact way. And if we change the numbers, say 100 and 100 and or 1002. Yeah, I mean, it works. All right, let's get rid of these console logs here and here. Okay. So, PA core have a likelier chance of survival if their DNA is made of made up of at least 60% C or G basis. In the returned object of PA core, add another method and call it will likely survive. And it returns true if the object's DNA array contains at least 60% C or G basis. Otherwise, will likely survive returns false. Okay. Uh, so... <clears throat> A function that calculates the object survival chances based on the C and G bases in their DNA array. 
All right, so const. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, we'll likely survive. All we really need to do is return a percentage. Um, so calculate survival, right? Yeah. Uh, and we will take in the object itself. Or we could take in the DNA. Because if we want to call this here, we can simply pass in the DNA array. From the object itself. And then when we call, wait, yeah, when we call the method itself, it won't have to have any parameters. So let's do DNA array. Let's say that. And right. And we have to return the percentage of survival. So uh, survival first percent p cent per cent equals let's say call it zero for now right and then we simply return survival percent okay so in between that we have to actually check so I think this is as simple as iterating through the array and just counting C's and G's. So um, we will need another counter equals zero. And then for uh, for base in, uh, for base of DNA array, all we really have to do is check if base equals C or base equals G. Right, and if that's the case, we simply increase the counter by one and break. And so at the end, we should have, uh, we should have wait, break. No, continue. I think it's continue. Or do we need anything at all? Maybe we don't. And so... <clears throat> after we have that we'll have our counter and to get the survival percentage all we have to do is uh, survival percent is equal to counter divided by 15 times 100 
let's put that into math.abs. Um, okay, let's do some tests. So we want to console log the DNA array just to check things manually. We also want to console log the survival percent. Right? And we also want to console log the counter at this stage. So if we call the function calculate survival on the first sp uh, specimen. Oh. Symbol dot iterator is not a function at calculate survival. Huh? Oh, because we have to pass in the DNA. Assignment to constant variable. Uh, my bad. Oh my god. Assignment to constant variable. Drive percent equals. Fine. There we go. So. Um, first of all, the check if counter is working correctly. So we need G's and C's. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's fine. And yeah, we should be getting the correct. Percentage. Oh, 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 oh. <clears throat> well, right, we don't need that. All we have to do is instead of ABS, we just do floor. 53. I think that's correct. So, um, <laughs> all we have to do here now is define a new function, which will be, will likely survive. And we take in the DNA. And then... We return... Whether... Uh... Whether calling calculate survival on the DNA will equal. No, we don't need to do anything. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, is at least 60%, so higher than 60. And if so, we return true. Uh, we return true. 
otherwise false. We should have kept these console logs here just for checking. Well, we can add them back. Uh, console log. Uh, so will be DNA array. And then the counter. And then the survival percent. But all of this has to happen down here. Okay. So now if we call uh, dot will like we survive like coolly, not like healy. So if we call, we'll likely survive. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have to pass it any arguments because we can just grab the DNA from this. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, we also need to console on this console lug why is it printing things twice because we're calling it twice are we calling it twice Yes, we are. We're calling Calculate Survival here. Uh, there we go. So 53 is false. 60 is false. Um, at least 60. Uh, so we should do... Bum, 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 bum. Is higher than 59. False, 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 true, 66. False, 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 true. Okay, it works. All right, so let's get rid of these statementos. Uh, let's tidy up this function a little bit. Right. And so, the last one. With the factory function set up, your team requests that you create 30 instances of PA core that can survive in their natural environment. Store these instances in an array for your team to study later. Okay, let's see if we can, uh, as a final thing, I think, after the break, let's see, we'll hack, because we'll do a little break uh, but after the break let's see if we can automate creating 30 specimens so yeah let's take a break and I'll be back in 10 
Okay, we are back, uh, noticing some technical difficulties here, 
Right. What in the... What in the bloody hell is going on here? Okay, there we go. All right. Let's get back in to it. What? It's broken again? Uh, wait. Give me one second. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, I guess we just write a new function. Yeah, that's all we really need to do. So at the bottom here, let's say a function that returns a spec a an array array filled with a specified amount of uh p a e a e q o u r p a core samples that have a likelihood of survival of above 60%. Okay. <clears throat> so we just do return lively samples and we just pass in how many samples we need. And we do what? Well, we just need a for loop. So for let i equal zero, uh, while i is less than is less than num i plus plus right console log i return lively samples oh missing initializer in const declaration as usual, we forget the equal sign. New. No. Oh, let's do 10. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's 10. Uh, the index themselves <clears throat> doesn't matter. So, right, uh, we can do what? We can generate a ram random number as the specimen number. Well, we need an array, right? So, uh, return an array uh no we return samples right and we initialize the samples here as an empty array 
And then for this, we do samples.push a call to the PA core factory. PA core factory. Uh, with, with what? Do, 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 with just a random specimen number. So let's do math dot floor math dot random. Uh. <clears throat> times times 10, right? Do, 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 do. I think so. So if we just console log this thing, yeah, we should be getting specimen three, specimen six, specimen one. Oh, they shouldn't repeat. That's the problem. Well, for that, I suppose we could use something else. We could just use the number itself, right? So, oh, wait, what? Specimen number 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. It's 10 everywhere. Uh. Oh, yeah, because I. Let's do I, let's do uh, specimen I, like so. Oh, it's wrong, wrong parentheses. Like so. So specimen zero, one, two, three, and nine. Yeah, so that should be fine. Wait, no. This gives us just specimens. Uh, what we actually have to do is only push the specimen if it is likely to survive. So <clears throat> Uh, how do we do that? Yeah. Well, we need to create a specimen. We create a specimen, then we have to check if it will survive. So we keep creating new specimens until we get one that will survive. 
Right. So if um bum 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 Huh. Wait a sec. <laughs> We call Piagor factory, right? That will create a new specimen. Hmm. What we need essentially is to recreate the sample if the likelihood of survival is less than 59%. we can check for it but the problem is oh we can actually do it based on the sample array length so here instead of i instead of checking against i we just check until sample uh, samples dot length length uh, length length is less than n yeah so then we create a new sample um we create a new sample by calling, let's say new uh, let or just const new sample equals calling the PA core factory. With say, uh, sample sample i right so this will give us <clears throat> an object and then we add if new sample uh, dot will likely survive is Yeah, if if new sample will likely survive, then we simply samples dot push new sample. Right? So we have sample zero, sample two, three, five, six, seven, eight. 15, 26, 27. And essentially, uh, pom, 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 let's also modify the calculate survival to no. Calculate survival returns the survival percent. Let's actually call uh, add a console log of calculate survival on this dot DNA. So sample number zero should pass should fail. Sample number two or number one should be added, and it did get added. Uh, three, four, wait, zero, one, two. 
three, four, five should be in here. Yes. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 14, 15, 16, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah. Okay, I th think it works. Uh, yeah, it does. That's exactly what we needed it to do. Okay. So, our forums to compare your project to our sample solution code. Sure. So, solution and share project below. Your solution might not look exactly like ours. How does yours look like? Uh, this it? Oh no, I don't want to download it. I want to look at GitHub. Uh, this? Yeah. Okay. So what they did was mock-up strand. Current DNA. Take our factory there. Uh, return specimen number, ray, mutate. Random index new base. Oh, they did everything in one. Okay. Uh, that's why I'm getting confused. It's like... <clears throat> so, the compare DNA is just this DNA, current DNA uh, score. Yeah, the counter. They did have two for loops and an if statement. So, pretty much the same thing. Except they did 100 divided by 5 instead of my backwards calculation. And will likely survive. We had a uh, DNA score, same thing, the counter, the survived strand. And yeah, pretty much, honestly, the same thing that I did. I guess I just had a few more additional helper functions, such as like the get, get random base index. And what else? And uh, yeah, I, I implemented this return lively samples automatically rather than I think that they did it. Uh... Oh, they didn't do it at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you'd like to challenge yourself further, you could consider the following. Create a sample complement strand method into the factory functions object that returns a complementary DNA strand. The rules are that A's match with T's and vice versa. Also C's match with G's and vice versa. What? A's match with T's. Oh, so instead of A's, you just get T's, and instead of C's, you get G's. I mean, that sounds pretty simple. It's just a matter of uh, iterating through both of these arrays, and then using an if statement to, to do some switcheroos. And compare DNA to find the two most related instances of PA core.
Well, I guess this would be kind of fun to implement. Because, but it's also fairly simple, I guess. Because we just run a counter and we we would run it for, let's say, a thousand times, right? So in, in thousand samples, uh, we could store the most matching one in a key value pair. Whereas in the key would be like the matching percentage and the value would be the object itself. <clears throat> so we'll leave that. But yeah, other than that, it's a pretty fun project. Uh, format code. Oh, it's an auto formatter. That's useful. Okay. Wait, they did have, uh, where was it? Next to the save, they should have a share button, but there isn't one. I would like to share this. But, oh well. Okay. We're done with the projects. We're done with JavaScript syntax part two. So, in this unit, we learned more JavaScript syntax. Congratulations. The goal of this unit was to continue introducing you to JavaScript. You learned more about data types like arrays and objects, you also learned how to debug JavaScript programs. Having completed this unit, you are now able to read and write JavaScript syntax for arrays, loops, objects, and iterators. Debug JavaScript code and parse error messages. Solve code challenges related to newly learned syntax. If you're interested in learning more about these topics, here are some additional resources. Ooh, we can create our own libraries of methods. Lodash JS library, which provides many methods that add new functionality for numbers, strings, objects, and arrays. Ooh, this seems interesting. Let's, uh, wait, let's, bookmark this for later then we have the MDN guide to objects which we already looked at and the digital ocean tutorial for iteration methods well this is not nothing new really uh, I guess we could could use this as a supplementary, but it's not as extensive as MDN. It just has for each map filter, reduce find and find index, whereas the MDN has all of them. So not that useful. All right, let's continue. There we go. The long awaited building interactive websites with JavaScript. So. What you'll be learning in this in the building interact websites with JavaScript unit. The goal of this unit is to learn how JavaScript is used to add interactive experience to the website. After this unit, we'll be able to add JavaScript to a website for interactivity, uh, describe what the DOM is, explain what DOM events are, and create forms using HTML and validate them using JavaScript. Cool, let's go. All right, so HTML defines the structure of a web page by using page elements as the building blocks. However, HTML by itself cannot produce web pages interactivity. That's where JavaScript comes in. Below, we see a post-it with a typical stick figure on it. We can think of this as the HTML. 
with the head, body, and limbs as the elements of the page. In web development, CSS provides a style to our HTML structure. Below the stick figure is below the stick figure is now dressed in a nice tuxedo. If HTML and CSS provide structure and style for this analogy, analogy, G JavaScript provides interactivity, allowing the stick figure to move. Below the stick the stick figure moves, swaying up and down, thanks to JavaScript. Web programmers use JavaScript to make web pages um, dynamic and interactive. This powerful scripting language is encapsulated in its own HTML element, the script element. You can think of this script element as the door to JavaScript for HTML. This lesson will dig deeper into what the script element can do for your websites and best practices on how and where to insert JavaScript in your HTML files. So the script tag. The script element allows you to add JavaScript code inside an HTML file. Below the script element, below the script element embeds valid JavaScript code. All right, so frankly, without the script tag, websites would be unclickable, unclickable. How is that such a difficult word to pronounce? Um, and a bit boring. The script element, like most elements in HTML, has an opening and a closing angle bracket. The closing tags, the closing tag marks the end of the content inside of the script element. Just like the style tag used to embed CSS code, you use the script tag to embed valid JavaScript code. So copy this code, code and paste it between the opening and closing JavaScript tags. Sure. Ba, 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 ba. And run. So what is it doing? Oh. When you click on it, it gives me flowers. All right. The source attribute. Since you know how to use the script element with embedded code, let's talk about linking code. Linking code is preferable because of a programming concept called separation of concerns. Instead of having messy code that is all in the same file, web developers separate their code into different files, making each concern easier to understand and more convenient when changes must be made. For this exercise, instead of writing JavaScript in our HTML file, we're gonna write it in its own file and then reference this code with a file path name. We will do this using an art attribute that may jog your memory, the source attribute. Okay, it seems familiar. If it seems familiar, that's because you may have been linking to external files with the image and link elements. The attribute is exactly the same, but now its value specifies the location of your script file. In this file, if the file is in the same project folder, the source value will be a relative path name. Below an example, below is an example of providing a relative path for a JavaScript file. All right, seems straightforward. Uh, the script above would look for a file called example script that is in the same file directory as our index HTML file. If you must refer to JavaScript hosted externally or in CDN, you can also link that file location. Okay, so uh, we need to add a script element with a source attribute that points to script.js. So uh, script right uh, source 
SRC, not SCR, equals dot script dot JS. Right? Right. What is this weird, spooky music? Let's do some jazz. All right. Now click on the Academy logo repeatedly to see random font families and font colors. Blop, 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 blop. So, how are scripts loaded? A quick recap. The script element allows HTML files to load and execute JavaScript. The JavaScript can either go embedded inside the script tag or the script tag can reference an external file. Before we dive deeper, let's take a moment to talk about how browsers parse HTML files into web pages. This informs where to include a script element inside your HTML file. Okay. So uh Browsers come equipped with HTML parsers that help browsers render the elements accordingly. Elements including the script element are by default parsed in the order they appear in the HTML file. So, uh, okay. So when the HTML parser encounters a script element, it loads the script, then executes, executes its contents before parsing the rest of the HTML. The two main points to note here are that HTML parsers do not process the next element in the HTML file until it until it loads and executes the script element, thus leading to a delay in load time and resulting in poor user experience. Additionally, scripts are loaded sequentially, so if one script depends on another script, they should be placed in that very order inside the HTML file. Okay. The GIF below displays two scripts being loaded. The first script makes a watering can appear. The second script makes a flower appear. This shows how scripts are loaded sequentially and how they pause the HTML parser which is why blooming appears at the end. Okay, let's take a better look at what's happening here. So first we load the watering can, then we load the flower, <clears throat> and then we add the blooming. All right. So, in the code editor, <coughs> script 2 depends on a variable in script 1, causing an error. We actually want our text to be blue instead of pink. Switch the order of scripts so that they load properly. Let's take a look. Uh, script 1 contains blue. Script 2 contains changing the color. to a new color from script one. And normally it's pink. Okay, so I guess all we have to do is just change 
the load the loading sequence. Right? Yeah. All right. I see the potential of this getting real messy real fast. Because you have style CSS setting styles, then you have script setting styles and blah, 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 blah. So probably not the best idea to be setting styles and scripts, but I don't know. We'll see. Defer attribute. When the HTML parser comes across a script element, it stops to load its content. Once loaded, the JavaScript code is executed and the HTML parser proceeds to parse the next element in the file. This can result in slow load time for your website. HTML4 introduced the defer and async attributes to the script element to address the user wait time in the website based on different scenarios. The defer attribute specifies scripts specifies scripts should be executed after the HTML file is completely parsed. When the HTML parser encounters a script element with the defer attribute, it loads the script but defers the actual execution of the JavaScript until after it finishes parsing the rest of the elements in the HTML file. Okay. So you just add defer. So when is defer useful? When a script contains functionality that requires interaction with the DOM. So basically all of the time. <laughs> the defer attribute is a way to go. This way it ensures the, H the entire HTML file has been parsed before the script is executed. So we want Codecademy to be blue, not yellow. Each script tag restyles the Codecademy logo, but the turn yellow JS executes last, making the front font, font color yellow. Add a defer attribute to turn BlueJS script and make it the last script that is downloaded and executed. Well. Uh. So just defer. <clears throat> so, huh. So essentially, what I'm gathering here is that defer just makes the script to be executed last. And so if we had a defer here, it would turn yellow because it's loaded later, right? And what about, oh, that's not a script. Right. Bum, bum, bum. Let's, can we duplicate this? Let's add a file, turn purple dot JS. And let's copy this into here and do purple, right? Then in our index, we add another script, which will be turn purple, turn purple with ID purple. Wayne's dot dev. 
Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the stream. We are messing around with JavaScript. Um, learning about, once it loads, uh, building interactive websites with JavaScript. Uh, okay, so if we do turn purple here and we add a defer here, then it should turn purple, turn blue. Why? Get element by the logo. Um, bum, 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 bum. Wait, style CSS. No, we're not accessing anything by ID. And this one doesn't change the color. Purple, yellow, cyan. And turn purple JS turns things purple. Unless it's not included in, in whatever further backdoor files they have. <clears throat> okay, let's remove this. It's yellow. Um, okay, maybe it's just not, I'm not changing the color properly. What about black? Will this work? No. Uh, <laughs> Get element by ID logo. ID, ID. What? Oh, there. Um, color black. It should change it. Hmm. Oh, well, let's not mess around with it. Let's move on. All right, async attribute. The async attribute loads and executes the script asynchronously with the rest of the web page. This means that the similar that similar to the defer attribute, the HTML parser will continue parsing the rest of the HTML as the script is downloaded in the background. Let's read that again, it didn't sink in. Um, HTML parser will continue parsing the rest of the HTML as the script as the script is downloaded in the background. Okay, so we're downloading and it continues to parse. With the async attribute, the script will not wait until the entire page is parsed. It will execute immediately after it's been downloaded. Aha. Okay. So it's useful for scripts that are independent of other scripts in order to function accordingly. Thus, if it does not matter exactly at which point the script file is executed, asynchronously, asynchronous loading is the most suitable option as it optimizes Web page, load, web page load time. Okay. Uh, so currently our text is pink because in the style CSS file we have a rule set for that. Add async attribute to the turn blue script to optimize the load speed. Okay, so it's the same as defer async blue. Okay. Uh, standard stuff, I guess. So, logically thinking, it loads the style sheet. Right? Which turns the color pink. And then, but... The script comes after, so it doesn't really make sense for it to turn pink because then 
it exec it should execute the script, which turns it cyan. Because that's the order of operations that we were presented. It loads this. I mean, it downloads this and it loads it. it turns pink, right? And then it downloads this and also loads it. Which should turn it blue. is useful for scripts that are independent of other scripts in order to function accordingly. So our turn blue, it does the same thing. Ah, never mind. It cannot change the color to cyan because it still hasn't have doesn't have access to the logo at that point if we move the script uh if we move the script oh no not here if we move the script here then it should turn blue yep okay got it i understand now and a sync so i guess now we start downloading this right with the async uh independent the parser will continue parsing the rest of the html as the script is downloaded in the background so it starts down downloading this but it continues parsing the document um and it will execute immediately after it's been downloaded. So possibly, right, what I'm thinking is that if we have an, an enormous HTML file and we load, for example, this script, we start downloading this script. Um, before No, we start downloading this script, right? And we continue parsing on. And our, say, the logo element is very, very, very far down. And if this downloads faster than the parser reaches this element, it will not change the color of the logo. That's what logic is suggesting me. And I think that's how it should theoretically work. Um, let's actually even... Oh, we won't be able to do that because it's an ID. Uh, could we do class? Logo. But then we'd have to rewrite the whole thing there just for the little test. Okay, never mind. Let's, we'll leave this theoretical. And we'll see if we can we encounter this in the future. So, uh, review. Not much to review. HTML creates a skeleton of a web page, but JavaScript inter introduces interactivity. The script element has an opening and closing tag. Blah blah blah. Everything's fine. Uh, the default scripts are loaded and executed as soon as the HTML parser encounters them in the HTML file. The parser typically waits to load the entire script before. From proceeding to parse the rest of the page elements. Uh, then we have defer, we have async. The old convention was to put scripts right before the body tag to prevent the script from blocking the rest of the HTML content. Now the convention is to put the script tag in the head element and to use defer and async attributes. Okay. Ah, that makes sense. Okay. Up next, test, quiz, video. All right, let's uh, let's watch a video. Let's just quickly pause the music. Hey guys, I'm Matt, a developer from Ohio. 
In this video, we're going to Hello, ask Matt. and answer, what is the DOM? If you've done any web development, you've probably at least heard the term. We're going to explain what the DOM actually is, learn what it looks like, figure out how to use it, and most importantly, why you should care about the DOM at all. So what is it? Well, most of the information we need is right in the name. DOM is an acronym, which stands for Document Object Model. In a broad sense, the document object model is the browser's internal representation of a web page. Every page relies on a DOM to spell out exactly what stuff should be on the page, and how that stuff relates to all the other stuff. To understand more about what the DOM is, let's take a look at each part individually. You may have heard web pages referred to simply as documents. The word document really just refers to any way of structuring information, articles, books, scientific papers, whatever. But from a web development point of view, document is another word for web page. So the DOM is a model of all the stuff on a web page or document. The stuff on a web page is objects, or at least that's what the DOM calls them. You may have also heard the term nodes or elements used to describe the stuff on a web page. These are types of objects, but what are these objects exactly? Well, the most obvious kind of stuff on a web page is the content. Every page has words. Content also includes images, videos, buttons, etc. All of those things are considered objects. You may have also heard this stuff referred to as elements, which is a specific kind of object. Another kind of stuff is structural elements, which are things like divs, containers, and sections. You may or may not be able to actually see all the structural objects on a web page, but they're needed to organize the content. The remaining stuff is mostly attributes. Every element has attributes. For example, HTML elements can have classes, styles, sizes, etc. All of these attributes are objects in the document object model, but they aren't elements like content or structure. The M in DOM is model. A model is a representation of something, and it helps us understand how that something is put together. There are models for anything you could think of, because complex things need some way to be universally understood, analyzed, and used. I'm sure you've seen blueprints, floor plans, IKEA directions, recipes. These kinds of models are instructions. They depict the objects in enough detail that someone can recreate the objects. Another kind of model is more like a summary of big ideas or complex systems. You can't build a galaxy, so you don't need instructions per se, but you can understand it with the help of models. So then, what kinds of models do we have as web developers? We have the DOM, which is a model of web pages. We'll see soon how it acts as a set of instructions for the browser to follow, and as a summary of web pages for us to read. So what is the DOM? It's a way to model the objects in a document. Or in simpler terms, the DOM represents the elements and attributes on a web page. Now that we know what it is, let's take a look at what it looks like. The DOM is a kind of data structure called a tree. All that means is that every object is hierarchically under another object. An object can have multiple children, but only one parent. When we talk about parents and children, we're referring to the relationships between objects. It brings me Fact back to my, are under uh, or within parent objects. my data structures course. You might even say that a parent object sort of owns its list of children. If we were to remove any object from this tree, all of its children and their children and their children's children would all be removed as well. A tree graph can be used to represent all sorts of models. For example, we can try to represent a galaxy, like I mentioned earlier. The top object, the parent of all parents, will be our galaxy itself. This position in the tree is known as the root node. The children of the Milky Way are its stars. There are obviously way more than two of these in our galaxy, but our model doesn't have to cover absolutely everything. Our star is called Sol, which is why we refer to our system as the solar system. The children of the solar system are its planets and other space stuff that orbits around the sun. Again, I'm not showing every orbital body here. It's important to realize that the children of an object don't have to be the same type of stuff. Here, we have two planets and an asteroid belt. Under Earth are planetary sections, like continents and oceans. We could go down and down this tree until we're talking about particles, but I think you get the idea by now. So yep. let's take this model of a galaxy and turn it into a model of a website. A website, or document, is structured in the same way as a galaxy. 
If you've written any HTML, you know that the HTML tag is at the top of the file, then head and body. In this example, we have a pretty standard website with a header, main section, and footer. In the header, there's a logo, a heading, and a navigation section. And let's not forget that attributes are objects too. The image is going to need a source attribute to reference a PNG or something. Every one of these things is an object, and every object has exactly one parent. This is the DOM. Or at least, it's one way of visualizing the DOM. So what does the DOM look like in real life? I mean, you won't see a tree like this in your code or in a browser. In my opinion, the best way to visualize a real website's DOM is to open up the developer tools in your browser. This is an image from Chrome's Inspect Element feature. This list of tags may not look like a tree structure at first glance, but it's the exact same information as our graph. Every indentation level in the inspector is a vertical level from the graph. The buttons to the left of some tags hide even more children than we can see here. So we still see that source is an attribute of image, which is a child of header, which is a child of body, which is a child of HTML. This is probably the most common way to visualize a DOM, because it looks just like HTML. Most web developers can read HTML, so it's helpful to see the document in a familiar format. Plus, because it's built into the browser, it's super easy to access. So, is the DOM HTML? This is a common misconception, because the most common way of viewing the DOM looks like HTML. But there are more ways to create a document than just HTML. Lots of technologies can be used. You can use PHP to generate HTML when the page is loaded, or you could use JavaScript to edit DOM elements on the fly. You can even use technologies like React or Angular to generate entire pages without writing any HTML. So the DOM isn't HTML. The DOM can be represented by HTML, just like it can be represented by the tree graph. These are formats that the DOM can be viewed in, but the DOM itself is the underlying data structure of objects that make up the document. Let's take a look at some ways to view the DOM. As we've seen, we can represent the DOM with this tree graph. This is the best way to graphically represent the DOM's actual data structure, but it's not very helpful when trying to write code. It can also be represented in the browser's developer tools, which I mentioned is probably the most common way. The inspect element tool allows us to see the document in a way that more closely resembles a web developer's understanding of web pages, in that it reads like HTML. Source code is another representation of the same document. We could figure out how a web page will look by reading the entire source, but tools like inspect element were created specifically so we wouldn't have to. The source code is, however, the only way of viewing the document that allows us to edit the document. It's a lot like how a musician can know what a song sounds like from its sheet music, or how an architect might know what a building looks like from its floor plan. These are all representations of a specific thing. And just like how we can know what a web page will look like based on the tree graph, developer tools, source code, the browser also knows what it'll look like. The rendered web page is another representation of the same document. We can edit the DOM via source code. A browser reads the DOM in order to render the web page. Because we can control the DOM with our source code, we can control the rendered web page. If you recall, I said earlier that a model can be either a set of instructions or a description. For a browser, the DOM is a set of instructions on how to build a specific web page. For a developer, the DOM is a readable description of those instructions. So how is that visualization useful to you as a developer? Now that you know how to visualize and understand the DOM, you can more easily control the instructions sent to a browser. No matter what language, library, or framework you're using, if you're changing something on a web page, you are using the DOM. Hey, thanks for watching. You can join the conversation by subscribing to this channel or leaving right. a comment below. Uh, pretty straightforward, really. Uh, elements are objects, and we can manipulate those objects in multiple ways. Right? Not going to paraphrase the entire video, but that's essentially the gist. Uh, all right, let's continue on. Oh my god, what is the DOM? Again. Okay, before we before we continue, uh, let's take a little break, stretch our legs, I need a bathroom break, <clears throat> and we'll be back in 10.
things are messed up again. We don't need this. There we go. 